Interestingly enough, and to, to your question, almost a, a, actually a very similar fact pattern happened in Arizona with Walmart and a Walmart employee who was injured on the job, went home, used medical marijuana, consistent with the doctor's recommendation and the medical marijuana card that the individual ha had was terminated, did the same thing, filed for wrongful termination. And in Arizona, this almost identical fact pattern, the court reversed the termination. Um, just one other example, as it closer to home, at least closer to the healthcare industry. Welcome to Be Informed, Be Well with John Malaka. Hey everybody, John Malanke, United Patient Group, be informed and be well, and I hope this finds you well. Today, I'm here with Alan Horowitz. He's an attorney at law with Arnell Golden Gregory. How are you doing, Alan? I'm doing just fine. Thanks, John. Thanks for having me. I know uh, your offices are, are uh, throughout the country, um, East Coast, middle of, the, middle of the country and East Coast, but you're located in beautiful Colorado. So I am. So kind of, kind of the heart of, of, of like California when it comes to medical cannabis. And so let's just get right into it. I mean, you work with a lot of senior, senior living facilities, nursing facilities, hospice. Not only are you attorney of 32, 33 years? 30, 32 years, correct. 32 years, but also a registered nurse out of Pennsylvania. So you've kind of covered the gamut and you can uh, talk the talk and speak, speak, speak the, the, the language um, that nursing facilities go through on a regular basis. So let's just start off here. Um, currently, how many, we're here in the United States, currently how many states are um, legal today for medical cannabis of some, some sort? Yeah, that's an excellent question. So as we speak, there are 37 states that have legalized medical marijuana. There are 18 states that allow recreational marijuana. Um, in my practice and in my focus has been on the medical marijuana end of things. And that, that's typically the question the questions that I get are typically from, as you referenced, nursing homes or hospices. Yeah. And, I'm sorry, go on. No, no, nursing home and hospice. And the thing that we see on a regular basis, and I'm certain you do as well, is that the confusion is not all states are the same, not only for patients, you know, for qualified conditions, but most certainly for, for nursing homes. And can, can you touch, touch up on that? Um, um, sure. What, what people are what people are running into on a regular basis. Yeah, the, the most typical question that I receive from the owners and operators of a skilled nursing facility, and by the way, there are um, roughly one and a half million skilled nursing facilities in the Medicare program. I'm sorry, fifteen thousand, one about one point five million residents in those nursing homes. And to the extent that the overwhelming majority of them, if not almost all of them are Medicare providers, when a provider, when a healthcare provider, such as a skilled nursing facility agrees to be in the Medicare program, they agree to abide by all federal laws. Now the problem for nursing homes, or one of the problems related to medical cannabis is that even if they're in strict compliance with state law, with those 37 states that have legalized medical marijuana, they're violating federal law because uh, under the federal paradigm, marijuana is still considered a Schedule I substance under the Controlled Substance Act of 1971, which I'll just editorialize. I think that's a bit ridiculous yeah. for the folks that uh, may or may not know. Schedule I drugs are LSD, methamphetamine, heroin, and to lump marijuana or cannabis in with heroin and LSD, um, it's, there's no scientific basis for that. Uh, with 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 basically a schedule one is uh, um, addiction and and cause harm, but also no medical uh, value, which unfortunately, you know, not a conspiracy theorist here, maybe a little during COVID, but the United States has a patent as uh, CBD is a neuroprotectant medical va medical value. Um, right. And so, so it, it's, it's confusing. It's confusing for a lot of patients, but confusing for a lot of doctors and, and nurses, and I'm certain for these facilities as well. So since you mentioned Medicare and you specialize a lot in Medicare and with the funding that the federal government gives to, patient, to facilities like this that have Medicare, cannabis being an illegal substance, not federally legal, legal, but legal at the state level, do they need to worry about losing these grants or funds or their jobs? <laughs> Yeah, that's an excellent question. Actually, it, the legal ramifications go further than losing their job or a grant. Um, theoretically, a healthcare provider could be terminated from the Medicare program, 
which then means automatically they're terminated from Medicaid, which would essentially dry up their revenue source and will put them out of business. That said, when I'm asked this question repeatedly, um, I'm cautiously optimistic and I think it's, it's very unlikely that you're gonna be prosecuted of, at the federal level, so long as you're in strict compliance with um, state law. And, and there are two reasons for that primarily. Um, there's something known as the Rohrbach or Farr Amendment, which I know that you're familiar with, which was first introduced in Congress in 2014. It's been reintroduced every year, um, including this year, it's in the fiscal year 2022 budget. Um, basically what the Rohrbach or Farr uh, Amendment uh, did was it was a rider to the appropriations bill. And it basically said to the Department of Justice, we're appropriating funds for you for the next fiscal year, Department of Justice, but you may not use these funds to prosecute anyone who complies with state law. And this has actually been tested in the court. There was a case a few years ago, the United States v. McIntosh, and actually there were 10 cases that were consolidated. There were 10 defendants from California and the state of Washington who were charged with felony possession of marijuana, and it was medical marijuana. And the Department of Justice brought them um, to, was prosecuting them for violating the Controlled Substance Act. Well, their defense was, well, wait a second, under the Rohrbach or Farr Amendment, Congress has already said, you, the Department of Justice, can't use funds to prosecute us, and here we are in federal court. The, this went all the way to the Ninth Circuit Court of Appeals and the Court of Appeals basically kicked the Department of Justice out and said, we understand and you lawyers should understand, you federal lawyers should understand that when there are two competing federal statutes, such as in this case, the Controlled Substance Act on the one hand and the intent of Congress, the more recent is going to trump um, the, the decision. And so um, the court threw the the case out. So that's one of the reasons why um, I, I now that's only binding in the Ninth Circuit, but I think that that reasoning, and since as we speak, that amendment is still in existence, at least through September of 2022, and has been every year since 2014, I think it's unlikely that any provider, and by provider, I mean a skilled nursing facility, or any of its employees, or any of its residents will be prosecuted. Again, the key is so long as uh, they're in compliance with state law. And I'll just quickly add, there's another reason that I, I would reassure facilities cautiously. I can't guarantee them um, this because they're technically breaking the law. The other reason goes back to the Obama administration, something I know that you're familiar with. It's called the Cole Memo. Yeah. Cole was the deputy attorney general in the Obama administration. And he sent a memo to all US attorneys that basically said, it was a four page memo, basically said, you know what? We, the United States Department of Justice had bigger fish to fry we're dealing with um, cyber crime, all sorts of you know, serious crime. We're gonna leave uh, the enforcement of marijuana up to the, our state partners. So there was the Cole memo, which by the way, was rescinded by Attorney General Sessions early on in the Trump administration. And then the Sessions rescission was effectively rescinded by Attorney General Barr, who when he <laughs> testified said, I have no intention of allowing the Department of Justice to prosecute anyone who complies with state law. So because of the, the Cole memo and, and then its resurgence under Attorney General Barr, <clears throat> pardon me, and the Ninth Circuit decision in McIntosh, as well as the rider to the appropriations bill that says Department of Justice can't use funds to prosecute anybody. I think that it would be reasonably safe. And I say that, um, and I'll just end with this, on the basis of the fact that I'm not aware of a single prosecution of any nursing home any nursing home employee or any nursing home resident uh, dealing with cannabis where they've complied with state law. So that's have, you run into, have you run into cases where they've been harassed at all? I know you made the two cases. It didn't sound like the, that there that was a nursing home that went, that um, that you were talking about. And so um, are you, cause I don't hear it. I don't hear about, I don't hear about that. And I've worked with a lot of hospice nurses where they just say, listen, end of life. We just turn our backs and go for it. I mean, I've had hospice nurses say we've even let them consume via via smoking, and that's 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 the one thing that I always that's a question that comes up quite a bit. May we are we allowed to have our residents uh, use medical cannabis? Um, and the majority of them prefer to do it, but they don't want to offend the other residents of there. So smoking is not on the top of the list. Vaporization, edibles, topicals. Um, is what patches of what they what they kind of prefer um, that their residents um, um, 
do legally, I guess. And so you, uh, it was funny. I bet your whole practice changed when the law, cannabis, cannabis laws, did you ever think that this was going to be part of your little repertoire? Actually, actually about seven years ago, I, I kind of saw this uh, happening. I, I thought that um, it was inevitable. Yeah. It, it's time has come. And once states like California and Colorado um, paved the way, it's hard to put the genie back in the bottle. Yeah. And you know, along those lines, um, you know, it's it, it's my sense, and I think that of a lot of people, that it, it, medical marijuana, in fact, recreational mar- marijuana as well, will be decriminalized. Um, as you know, there are a couple, there's some pending legislation in both the House and the Senate. The MORE Act, um, pardon me, in the House, which is already uh, received uh, support. Uh, how far that'll go in the Senate is an open question, but the Senate has a, um, a separate package of legislation that would decriminalize uh, medical marijuana. So I think, I mean, the trend is here. And if you consider the fact that with 37 states having already legalized medical marijuana, that means the majority of, of citizens, uh, residents in the United States live in jurisdictions where it's legal at the state level um, I'm quite sure the uh, the rest will follow suit. Yeah, it's funny you say the rest will follow, and you you saying California and Colorado years ago. I want to say 2012, maybe. I received a call from a gentleman. He was a, a, a medical doctor from the Department of Health of the state of New Jersey, and he called one day and he said, "Okay, I've been put on this. He's I'm kind of the black sheep of this department, and so they put me onto this onto this uh, this this job. I guess I need to talk." with someone who knows California law um, about medical cannabis. And I said, well, I could share some things. He's a, he goes, I don't need, I don't really need the law law portion, but we need to see what's working there and what's not working there. Can you share so I can take it back to our state and see if we can improve that here in the state of New Jersey. I said, of course. So we did that. And about a year later, he called me again. Do you remember me? I said, of course I remember you. He goes, they have me back at it again. I go, what? He goes, <laughs> Colorado law now is recreational. What do you see the good and the bad, the ugly with that? Like bring back to the state of New Jersey. And so it's, you know, each state is different. Each state law is different. And so is it legal here in California? Is it the same thing? I mean, there are some states that didn't approve cannabis, excuse me, didn't approve cannabis qualification for cancer patients. Pennsylvania just approved pain as a qualified mm-hmm. condition a couple of years ago or a year ago, you know, and so it's tough when you're you know, working with patients and it's like, doc, I have this, I'm sorry, but that's not a qualified condition. It's like, <laughs> what do I have to do? I mean, work with a lot of Utah patients. Epilepsy was legal. Cannabis was not, a, I mean, a, a cancer was not a, a legal qualification. And so, you know, you kind of, they automatically become, um, you know, cannabis refugees or you send mom and dad to another another retirement community or another nursing facility in a different state so they can have access. I mean, this comes up quite a bit. You know, a patient, they're used to having this medicine. It is medicine. Um, and then going into a facility, say, sorry, you know, Mr. Jones, you're not allowed to bring this in here. It's like, wait a minute, this is what's been keeping me alive, you know, and sure. so... Um, and I know for our audience, and, and I know uh, you with Alan, I'll just throw a disclaimer, you know, Alan is not giving uh, uh, legal or medical advice for now. If you do need legal advice, um, I'm certain his, his firm would love, love, to, love to speak with you. We would if you love need to medical answer. advice, my, you know, find, find a, a medical professional uh, that really can help you with this as well. And so there's your disclaimer. That's, that's the lawyer side of me. It's, I had to well, step. thank you. I, I appreciate that. If I could just add um, a thought to what you just said about yeah. the, essentially the patch quilt, of, patch quilt of state laws. One of the other um, concerns that I see or my clients around the country see is that the laws are, are so different from state to state. So some states allow smoking, um, other states do not. Uh, a typical example, example, so in Georgia where our firm is has its head, headquarters, uh, when Georgia decriminalized medical marijuana and only medical marijuana a few years ago, the Georgia legislation required that it could only be in one form and one form only, and it's called low THC oil. And that could only cannot exceed to more than 20 fluid ounces of 0.5% THC in a pharmaceutical grade container. Texas uh, allows, I think, 10 times that amount of THC. So, and, th- and that creates a problem for a resident, let's say a resident's in a skilled nursing facility or in hospice in one state, in Colorado, 
where, uh, where California, where the forms are much more, there are multiple forms of cannabis and they move to Georgia. Well, the only form that's available in Georgia is the low THC oil. So that creates a problem of continuity of care. How does someone who's either in hospice or in pain or has a, another uh, qualifying medical condition, how do they get the, the form of cannabis that they've been using, which has provided them relief as they migrate from state to state? So it's, again, there, there's a lack of consistency uh, yeah. because the feds you know, have had hands off. You know, we did an article years ago about, we worked with a lot of Texans and a lot of uh, Georgians and Georgia, we worked a lot of families that they had to try all these. And if these other um, modalities did not work, then you could use cannabis. And we did an article, it was almost like you can have a driver's license, but we don't allow cars. Right, right, exactly. You know, so, so we did an article, it was entitled uh, Atlanta, the pretend state or something like that. And it got a lot of coverage and a lot of patients said, you're right. You know, I mean, I, I brought mom and dad to facility. They can't use it. My child has, you know, seizures. They can't use it. And so a lot of them were, were forced to move out of state to legally obtain, to obtain this. You know, as the laws in the states grow, um, it's confusing. Some are medical states versus recreational states. So in a nursing facility or, uh, or a facility where, where patients, uh, elderly are, are living, uh, being taken care of, do they need to go? So California, Colorado, use California, Colorado, recreational states, 21 and over. Do they need to, when they're in this facility, do they need to go get a legal recommendation from their doctor like they used to, or a state and issued card like, the, like the, they, they can or cannot, but being 21 and over here in, in California, anybody can come in here like you're going into a bar and say, hi, I'd like to have that. Yeah, I, I think the short answer, and again, it's going to depend on the specific state and the state's laws, since there's no <laughs> federal law governing this. Uh, and my understanding is that most states for recreational marijuana, one doesn't need to possess a, a card because obviously it's recreational. So you, the yeah. prerequisite of a qualifying medical condition um, is, is not there. So again, there's, there's no requirement that I know. On the other hand, what I've seen with some many nursing facilities around the country where somebody wanted to uh, use recreational marijuana and the facility said no, they could do that because they could even say no if somebody wanted to use medical marijuana because the facility could say we can't violate federal law. And actually, there are probably still, I'm, my guess is, based on my empirical uh, interaction, the majority of nursing facilities do not allow medical marijuana at this point. I, I think that's slowly starting to change um, as their <clears throat> comfort level uh, increases we're, we're, we're seeing it out here where it's def definitely increasing. Let me ask you the question. You, you also work with employment law, you know, and a lot of companies, especially ones that are being uh, getting grants and, and uh, like Medicare, um, um, they do do drug tests. So what happens to employ a nurse, a caregiver that's helping a patient with their medicine if it's uh, if they're smoking it or vaping it? And now it's in their system. Do you have you run into that? I'm certain there are cases out there like that. There I are, haven't run into that, but that's yeah. an excellent question. I have run into the situation. And I'm aware of cases where an employee has tested positive for cannabis and been fired. And the problem with that is that there's no consistent approach yeah. um, by the states. And I'll give you um, just a couple of quick examples. So in Michigan, a couple of years ago, the case was Cassius, C-A-S-S-I-A-S. Um, and Cassius worked at a Walmart in Michigan, um, had worked there for a number of years, was pushing a cart, twisted a knee or an ankle, went home, came in the next day and had a limp. Um, because he was limping the next day, consistent with Walmart's policy, he had to go to the emergency room. Um, Cassius um, did have um, a card, a medical marijuana card, consistent with Michigan's Medical Marijuana Act. Um, it was recommended by his physician. He had a sinus uh, problem um, and an inoperable brain tumor. Pretty serious stuff. And his oncologist had recommended medical marijuana, which he took when he went home. It never interfered with his work performance. Anyway, when uh, the emergency room uh, drug testing 
revealed the presence of cannabis, he was terminated from Walmart. He sued uh, for wrongful termination, and that case actually was moved to federal court. It went, it was the federal court in the Sixth Circuit, and the federal court upheld the termination. Interestingly enough, and to to your question, almost a sim, uh, actually a very similar fact pattern happened in Arizona with Walmart and a Walmart employee who was injured on the job, went home, used medical marijuana, consistent with the doctor's recommendation and the medical marijuana card that the individual ha had was terminated, did the same thing, filed for wrongful termination. And in Arizona, this almost identical fact pattern, the court reversed oh. the termination. Um, just one other example, as it closer to home, at least closer to the healthcare industry, a couple of years ago, there was a director of activities hired for a nursing facility in Connecticut. And she disclosed on, uh, during an initial interview or secondary interview, I use medical marijuana. I have PTSD, secondary to a serious motor vehicle accident. I'm a registered un user consistent with the law in Connecticut. My doctor has recommended this. It will not interfere with my performance. And they withdrew the offer of employment, not singer, was the name of that case. Um, so Knopfsinger sued for essentially wrongful termination. She was terminated because she had already been offered the position and, and that case settled. So whether it's, uh, and finally, uh, one last case in California, there was a case, Ross v. Raging Wire Telecommunications that went all the way to the California Supreme Court where in a pre-employment physical, similar to the case I just described with the activities director, uh, in a pre-employment physical, uh, Ross tested positive for cannabis and was not allowed to, to work and, and sued and basically said, I have a disability. If I was using insulin and, and you withdrew the offer of employment, that would be discrimination. I'm using medical marijuana consistent with California law. My doctor has recommended it. Uh, and that went all the way to the California Supreme Court. And in a surprising decision, the California Supreme Court upheld the termination in that case, wow, yeah, very surprising. Wow. The dissent was stinging. The the dissent in that case, and it's Ross v. Raging Wire Telecommunications. The uh, judge that dissented with majority opinion basically yeah. said, um, in California now, an employee has to choose between working, having a job, or getting pain relief from medical marijuana. It, it's 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 crazy. I had heard of the the, the Arizona um, Walmart case that 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 did make uh, national news, and so. With this, what what can you share with 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 employees um, who are in these facilities that, of course, don't want to lose their job, but they want to help the patients? Um, what, what can you share with our audience? Well, my advice to clients has always been um, to be as proactive as possible. Um, and towards that end, I recommend that the facility itself have a policy and procedure. Either they're going to allow marijuana or yeah. they're not. Either they're going to allow medical and or recreational or not. Either um, they have a policy regarding employees or they don't. And the reason for that is let everybody know, both prospective residents, prospective employees, as well as current employees, this is our policy. Um, I, I think that's the best yeah. way to approach it. Um, that way there's no surprises. Uh, just be proactive, whatever your position is. Um, and again, at this point in time, as long as it's still a, uh, schedule one controlled substance, facilities can legally say, we're not going to permit any resident to, to use it. We're not, and if any of our employees um, are found to have cannabis in their blood, we can terminate them. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, again, I think that being proactive and just having a policy and procedure, disseminating that, educating your staff um, and letting all, I will even go so far as um, recommending nursing facilities post their policies and procedures on a web. There shouldn't be any secrets. I believe in transparency. Let yeah. people know. So if you're thinking about placing a loved one in a nursing home and your loved one is uh, getting relief from medical marijuana, you want to know, I think, ahead of time whether or not the facility is going to permit that. Likewise, if you're a nurse, nurse aide, therapist, uh, if you're thinking about working in a particular facility um, and you are a medical marijuana user, then I think you, you want to know ahead of time before you accept the position, does this facility allow it? Or if I use it on my own time and it doesn't interfere with my performance, uh, will I get, or could I get terminated? So gotcha. again, being proactive, I think is the best way to go. Proactive. And I think hospitals are starting to do that because you're, you're starting to see these on the intake forms as well. 
you right. know, it's a, it's a new check checkbox about med- medical cannabis. Um, you know, with the laws changing day to day and state to state, um, would you recommend these facilities to to uh, reach out to your law firm or a law firm in in their local area just to ask? I mean, it it just seems like to cover their behinds. Um, sure. Now, uh, thank you for that question. Uh, I, I don't want to sound self serving. I'll just say. Uh, we do um, a fair amount of legal representation for growers, distributors, yeah. uh, people throughout the, the spectrum involved with cannabis. Um, that, and we have a national practice. Our, our, our firm is involved with legal Good. issues, clients in all 50 states. So the only caveat that I would um, advise uh, folks about is we're, whoever you choose to um, legally represent you, whatever law firm or, or attorney, um, he or she or the firm should have substantial experience in the area. Uh, it's not, this is not an area for general, in my estimation, for a general practitioner who maybe does some real estate closings, maybe some wills, maybe some divorces. You, uh, you, you really want somebody, you know, whether it's on the real estate and then such as, you know, owning the, the crops or transactions um, or any other aspect of, along the distribution chain, you'd be best having um, an attorney or firm that has deep experience in that particular area. And there's no shortage of law firms throughout the country that have that degree of expertise. Yeah, it's funny. I would say that. Including ours. Yeah, including yours. And so I'll I'll throw another plug there in in there shortly here before we get off. Um, But I see that with, I talk about that with um, uh, the medical professionals as cannabis laws, I said, are improving, as you said, you know, 37 states are, are legalizing in some form. The education for doctors is not keeping up with the laws. And so I have a lot of patients of all ages, a lot of seniors actually will say, okay, John, I went to my doctor and he or she said, I can use cannabis. What do I do now? I just think that's, that's doing a disjustice. If you're going to recommend medical cannabis to your patient, uh, make sure he or she knows that it's not a one size fits all. And I'm certain the same thing with the same thing with, with, with law. You know, it's not a one size fits all. Speak to a, a someone who specializes. And I'm glad you said that someone who specializes in cannabis law. And I know your, your firm does that as well. You know, as, can, as the stigma is dropping with cannabis, I mean, when we started this, you know, my wife and I started this uh, Unite Patient Group back in 2010, 2011. It was still hush hush. No one really wanted to hear it yet. Like whisper, what, what kind of line are you work? medical cannabis and we'd go to medical conferences and do have our booth we'd go to pharmacy conferences have our exhibit booth and people would walk by i'm not looking i'm not looking and then the following year people would start talking about it shoot i go to church with my mom and her girlfriends are coming up okay i'm doing this i'm sleeping better i'm not i'm, I'm rubbing the top up i'm not in pain i'm able to walk you know so the stigma is dropping and then we're seeing all these different you know cbd so cannabis has about 140 different cannabinoids. THC, which mm-hmm. many are familiar with, is a psychoactive cannabinoid is what people relate that to. CBD, the non-psychoactive, which you're seeing everywhere from gas stations, grocery stores, all over um, uh, the you know pharmacy, CVS, Walgreens, uh, D- Dwayne Reed, wherever you're located throughout the country. There's so many to choose from, but the stigma is starting to, to, to drop or being lowered, the walls being lowered. And where do you see, where do you see uh, the future of cannabis? Well, I definitely think it's going to be um, com- decriminalized. I, I think it, it, it's days of, of residing as a schedule one controlled substance yeah. are numbered. I, 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 and I think that some of the states. Do you, were, do you think it should be so? Do you, so I'm not, sorry to interrupt you. Do you think it should should still be changed to another schedule or not scheduled at all, like some other uh, plant medicine um, supplements? You know, I'm I'm leaning towards not scheduled at all. I'm aware of legislation. Yeah. Um, I think it's called the One to Three Act, where uh, that proposed legislation would decal would de- declassify marijuana as Schedule One and put it in Schedule Three. Um, I think that, um, you know, I, I, I think that the appropriate way to answer that question is for there to be um, an unbiased commission to look into it and see if it truly warrants being scheduled three or four or no schedule at all and can be o- over the counter, yeah. much like uh, fish oil or so many other herbs and, totally. and supplements. I just want to touch on one thing you'd mentioned um, 
if someone is seeking legal advice, and thank you for echoing this comment, the person, the attorney or the firm should have expertise. The same thing is true with physicians. If you're looking for a recommendation from your physician. So I know of a physician, Dr. Zach Pallas, um, who is the chief medical officer at the Hebrew home um, in Brooklyn. And I'm mentioning his name only because he's appeared in the New York Times um, and other public media. And Zach and I've done presentations on medical marijuana. And I once asked Zach, well, consistent with New, New York law, when you're recommending medical marijuana for your residents in a nursing home or the docs that you supervise, you know, what, what are the guidelines? And, and Zach was um, elegant in his simplicity. He said, well, there's an old adage in medicine, start low and go slow. I will start with 10 milligrams and work my way up. So again, and a lot of physicians might not know, you know, or might not have experience in that approach. I did a presentation um, for the Ohio Medical Directors Association recently. And in looking at the Ohio statute, I was encouraged to see that any physician, and many states do require this, any physician that's going to be able to recommend medical marijuana is required to have either two hours of continuing medical education credits or something similar to that, but to have some formalized training so that they're not willy-nilly saying, okay, I'm going to recommend three gummies a day. So well, I, I think again, you, you mentioned that, and that's, that's another topic because it's, I think it's, it's again, not truly helping the patient because a lot, a lot of the recommending physicians, some of these legal states now take a two hour course up to a six hour course. And okay, now, now you're a recommending physician. Right. And do they know the endocannabinoid system? They, do they know drug to drug interaction? Do they know the laws? Do they know, you know that each cannabinoid plays, plays a role? And so, like you said, less is more, start low, go slow. I've seen patients have success with two milligrams. Mm -hmm. You know, it depends. I mean, we're all, we're all different. And so, you know, I've seen, you know, in the 12 years of being in this industry, I've seen a lot of good, bad, and the ugly, but I've seen, a, I mean, I, I'm the first to say cannabis is not the golden pill, the golden ticket. Um, I've seen it work. I've seen it not work. I've seen it, you know, I've seen it, uh, but change people's lives, um, you know, for the better for, you know, how we started. My father-in-law was diagnosed with ca cancer. He was given two weeks to live. We asked about medical cannabis um, uh, for appetite uh, stimulation, nothing else. We didn't know anything about the medical benefits. Um, and he just passed May, 2021 of old age. He was diagnosed in, in, uh, uh, 2011. And so came back, no evidence of recurrent disease using cannabis that put, that led us on this journey of education. You know, my wife, who I called Mary Poppins, didn't drink, didn't smoke, worked out, did everything you're supposed to do um, passed a pancreatic cancer, you know? And so to me, hitting a grand slam out of the park with my father-in-law was, was, oh my God, this is an incredible plant. And that was success to me saving a life. Others success definition is I'm off my meds. I'm sleeping better. I'm not in pain. I'm able to walk down the street. My spouse passed and I'm in this nursing facility or a living facility. And I'm able to get back into the community and be around people again, because I'm kind of, it's helped me getting out of my depression, helped me getting out of my, my anxiety, helped me get out of my internal body pain, which, you know, I went through with, with, with the pain of losing my wife. And so, um, you know, so I've seen a lot of benefits that this plant offers. And again, it's not for everyone. And again, I just hope that this is your body and for the facilities and the patients that are listening, you know, this is your body, your life. Don't, it's not illegal to ask questions. So don't be, don't be afraid to ask questions. And if your doctor is not open to the discussion, ask him to recommend another doctor to you because um, you know, I, I, I just think it's something that uh, people, if they're going through something and something else is not working, you know, try, don't be afraid to try, but I truly believe that a medical professional should be involved. And when you're dealing with law, a, a, a law specialist should be involved as well. But uh, I know you're down there at Arnell, Golden and Gregory. So I was going to give that one more plug for our listeners and I'll put all your information on there um, as well. But do you have any closing words for our audience? I really appreciate you coming yeah, on. Yeah, sure. Thanks very much. And thank you for this opportunity, John. Yeah. I, I truly appreciate it. I, I just want, want to... Um, share a study that was published in a 
a medical journal called Health Affairs a few years ago. And the researchers looked at Part D claims, which are the Medicare uh, prescription claims. They look, focused on, on the 17 states at the time, and this was, I believe, in 2013. Um, they looked at the 17 states that had legalized um, medical marijuana. They found that in those states, the Medicare trust fund saved in one year alone, 165 or $162.5 million. They dug down deeper because um, they were curious, how come those states are paying less? What they found was a precipitous drop in oxycontin, um, hydrocodone, oxycodone, and to the extent, and I've heard empirically from chief medical officers, folks like Dr. Zachary Pallas at the Hebrew Home in New York and other chief medical officers and medical directors of nursing homes, that they've been able to wean their patients, their residents off of narcotics uh, and replace them with medical marijuana. And to my knowledge, nobody's died from an overdose of, no. of cannabis. No. Um, it's a lot safer. Um, and that seems like a win-win situation to me. I mean, you now oh, have right. people using medical marijuana as opposed to opioids for their pain management. Um, they're less likely to overdose and die, less likely to become hopelessly addicted. Um, so I, I think that there's some very, and that's just in one area, that's just in pain relief alone. Obviously there are no less than 16 different qualifying conditions that medical marijuana seems to uh, alleviate. Oh, so I, I think that it's, it's at least worth looking into. It's, it's a serious discussion that somebody who's have, who has a serious condition, one of the qualifying conditions, they should have that discussion with their physician, assuming, and if their physician has no experience in that area, I think it would be appropriate to ask a physician, can you recommend that someone that I can talk to who can give me advice and guidance in terms of what might be helpful? Yeah. yeah. And I, by the way, I think you're doing a great service. I, I appreciate it. I like how, because I was, I, I always use the win-win uh, uh, example. You know, I, I truly, it, it is a win-win. Let me ask you this before we get out of here. Um, will insurance co co uh, ever be covered? Because this is a this is a topic I get on a regular basis from from seniors. Is my does my insurance cover this? Does my will it cover this? That'll be up to the. It's an excellent question and one that is increasingly being asked. Obviously, that's up to each individual insurer. Um, at this point, Medicare does not pay for it, and Medicaid yeah. does not. Um, whether they will in the future. Um, I can see that uh, I can see that happening. So, for example, if in a couple of years from now, when you and I are having this conversation, and uh, there's no federal prohibition, if somebody, if a resident in a nursing home or a patient at home has been weaned off of um, Percocet, which Medicare was paying for, and it, it's being replaced with medical grade cannabis, why wouldn't the government pay for it? Actually, the government could theoretically even be saving money, but it would be better for the patient. So, I would think that. The Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services, which is a federal agency that oversees Medicare, uh, would want to have an interest in, in patients not overdosing and not becoming ad addicting and would encourage patients to use medical marijuana rather than dangerous opioids. So it's a long way to answer. It, it's up to each insurer. I think the insurers will, the private insurers will probably wait and see what Medicare does. And I think that there's going to be a lot of pressure on Medicare, yeah. certainly within a three to five year window. Yeah. You made that you made that thing a comment about money. It is it is you know the government will save money, but the pharmaceutical companies will lose a lot of money. So, uh, but anyway, Alan, I appreciate appreciate you coming on and and uh, sharing your your expertise and background and story uh, with with uh, myself and my audience as well. And I appreciate your time, and we'll see you we'll see you again. I look forward to it. Thanks for the Thank opportunity, you. John. Everyone, Thank John Malanka and Alan Horowitz. With uh, We're here with the United Patient Group. Be informed and be well. And wishing you all a blessed day. Have a great day, everyone. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye now. Thank you for listening to Be Informed, Be Well with John Malanka. Be Informed, Be Well is brought to you by United Patients Group. Come and visit us at unitedpatientsgroup.com. And thanks for listening.